How we doing tonight, church? Welcome someone around you. It is good to see all of you. And let's all stand together. Come on, welcome someone, man. Say hi to someone. Don't be so shy. We all know each other. Man, we need some energy. All right, all right. Facebook, we welcome you. Thank you for joining us tonight. And let's all just go to the Lord in prayer before we get started. God, we thank you for this night, and we thank you that we can be in your house, Lord. We thank you that uh, we can gather as your people, and God, every time we do that, you are so present here, and we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much that we can come here and just learn about you, Lord, to grow in our faith and to deepen in our faith, and I pray that you would just speak tonight through your word, challenge us, and God, as we worship you and as we read your word, God, I pray that we would leave here changed. We give you this night, and we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.
on, give us some praise. Lord, you're worthy. Just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you, yeah. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a heart. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, and I know it's not much. I've nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Glory to your name. Praise his holy name. Worthy is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. We might not have much, but we can offer you a hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you for your word, your death, your burial, your resurrection. You didn't have to do it. We offer you a sacrifice of praise. Thank you for your mercy your kindness, your grace, your everlasting love. Great is your name and greatly to be praised. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Bless his holy name. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Glory, honor, power, and praise belongs to him. There is no one else like God. No one, he has no equal. All praise, all glory belongs to him. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Savior of the world. He didn't have to do it. It cost him everything. It cost us nothing. How dare we not praise him? Lift your hand. Hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bless your name, Lord God. Glory, 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 glory to your name, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. We enter your gates with thanksgiving. We enter your courts with praise. He alone is worthy to be praised. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, bless this day, Lord God. Thank you for what you're going to do, Lord God. I bless you like now, Lord God. Thank you for the youth, Lord God. Thank you for each and every one of the hearts young for you, Lord God. The things that they can do for you, Lord God, at that young age. Lord God, minister to the hearts. Touch them. Cause them to be still, quiet, and listen to the Holy Spirit. And lead and guide and direct their hearts, their desires towards you, Lord God. We thank you for forgiveness of sin, past, present, and future. Who would want to serve a God like that? Thank you, Lord God. Healer, deliverer. Oh, we pray for Larry Dingle today, Lord God. He needs our prayer, Lord God. We pray for him, Lord. His body, touch his body, his mind, his spirit, Lord God. You know all things. You created him in his mother's womb. You know before we do, Lord. Our job is to pray to you, Lord. I ask you to touch a minister and watch what God can do because he's not a man that he should lie. He's not. He's worthy. Thank you for today, Lord God. We bless the people here today, Lord God. Minister and touch. Watch over the service, Lord God. Give Pastor Bill the words, Lord God, that will stir us, that will change us, Lord God, cause us to do what the Lord wants us to do. So we thank you. We praise you. We bless you right now. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Youth are able to, you can go. Thank you, Lord God. I want to introduce Pastor Bill. Anyone new here tonight that did not get a uh, booklet last week? Let's see. Okay, we got a couple. So, got at least two. Jerry wasn't here. This cow. Good. Great. Great to have you. Remember to pray for Pastor Cindy. This has to be the roughest aspect of her life, to have to stay away from the people that she loves. You know, it's just, uh, I was just thinking about her and that fact and how it must ache Jesus' heart to be separated from us. But there's coming a day soon. <laughs> Hallelujah, where our faith will be turned into sight. Okay, uh, last week we were in Ezekiel 36, 
and uh, we looked at the land. God started transforming the land. There was a land without people and a people without a land, and God was going to bring them together. And about 1850, ending about a 1800-year drought, God started sending rain back to the land of Israel. Increased about 10% a decade. And it just began to increase. The land started becoming fruitful again. It was get, God was getting it ready for a people that he was going to bring. And then he started bringing the people from the east and the west and the north and the south. And Israel became a nation. As Isaiah 66, 8 said, one, one day they'll become a nation. And they did. And May 14th, 1948. So we're going to pick up from there and go into Ezekiel 37. Uh, once again, Ezekiel is going to be asked to prophesy, but this time to a valley of dry bones. Ezekiel 37, 1 to 4. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, thou knowest. And again he said to me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is a parable, but God is about to revive some dead things. In verse 11, God tells Ezekiel that this is the whole house of Israel. Ezekiel saw Israel as a valley filled with old dried old bones. And in verse 3, God asked him, Can these bones live? God was about to bring the bones together, lay sinew upon them, and uh, ultimately breathe on them. Uh, if we're in Ezekiel uh, 37, 9, the word wind and breath are the same word. So he was going to send a wind, it was going to be breath to these bones. In verse 15 to 23, they will be one nation. Israel was the united kingdom under David and Solomon's reign. It then split into two king kingdoms under Solomon's son Rehoboam around 975 B.C. The ten northern tribes were called Israel. The two southern tribes were called Judah. They had separate kings, and this lasted for about 253 years. In 722 B.C., the northern kingdom Israel was taken captive by the Assyrians. The tribes, for the most part, lost their distinction. In time, they intermarried and some filtered back into the land of Israel, and they were known as Samaritans. Uh, they were despised for the Jews for intermarrying, for they not only mixed their blood with the Assyrians, but also their religion. So they were half, half Jewish in their religion, half Assyrian, what have you. The southern kingdom fell to Nebuchadnezzar in 606 B.C., and after the Babylonian Empire was defeated by the Medo-Persian Empire, they were released and many returned 70 years later, around 536 B.C., as Jeremiah had prophesied. In time, the Greeks came and in Rome, and Rome dispersed the Jews in 70 A.D. and 135 A.D. For the most part, any distinction of tribes were gone. The last half of the 37th chapter notes that there will be one nation of Jews. There would not be two nations as there were at Ezekiel's time. God was going to revive a nation that was dead. God was going to bring back as one those that had been scattered like the bones had been scattered for nearly 2,000 years. The Jews were scattered all over the world to every, every corner. And God was going to revive a dead language as well. There's never been a dead language that has been revived. But uh, Hebrew had become a dead language. It was no longer spoken of as a language only in religious services. But a na man named Eliezer ben Yehuda felt the burden that Hebrew should be spoken. So in the early 1900s, he would not allow anything but Hebrew to be spoken in his house. He isolated his family, his kids. They only spoke Hebrew. And... Uh, he received great condemnation for starting to publish Hebrew magazines that was all written in Hebrew. And then he started to write a dictionary because there was no words in the Hebrew for bicycle. 
tomato, things like this. So he compiled words in the Hebrew language. And again, there are a lot of uh, condemnation. But the Jews were starting to come back into Israel from all over the world. But they all spoke different languages because Hebrew was a dead language and they couldn't communicate. Uh, but Zephaniah 3 9 says, For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent or with the same yoke. Z Jeremiah tw uh, 31 23, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as yet they shall use this speech in the land of Judah and in the cities thereof. When I bring again their captivity, the Lord bless thee, O habitation of justice and mountain of holiness. When God brings them back from their captivity, he is going to give them one language, and it's going to be Hebrew. And God will revive worship, and he will make himself known unto Israel. In verse 12 and 14, he talks about bringing Israel back into their own land and then pouring his spirit on them. But I want you to look at verse 10. Ezekiel 37, 10, he says, So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. For the longest time, I had a lot of trouble understanding certain parts of Ezekiel 37, and this part too. And as I was meditating, something came to mind about this great army God was raising up out of these dry bones. And as, as Zechariah 12:8. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them in that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. David was a great warrior. The women in Israel sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. He was the general of Israel's army. But in the last days, even the feeble among the people will become warriors and indeed they had to be Israel since they had become a nation again have continually been outnumbered 40 to 1 and has survived war after war against impossible odds there's only been four years in Israel's history where there haven't been a, where there hasn't been a terrorist attack of some sort and you have a list in the papers that was handed out of the wars that have been in Israel since 1948. The War of Independence, 48 and 49. The Suez War in 56. The Six Day War in 67. The War of Attrition. Uh, the Yom Kippur War. The First Lebanon War. The First Intifada. Uh, an Arab Uprising. And then there was a second. Uh, the Second Lebanon, uh, Lebanon War. The First Gaza War. Second Gaza War. Third Gaza War. And now the Fourth Gaza War is still going on. Started in October last year. And now with Lebanon again, uh, there's over 400 dead in the latest Israeli attacks against Lebanon. When I was in Israel uh, in uh, 2018, I was on the Lebanese border at a small army post. There was four or five soldiers there. They were to defend the border. And it was just across a short valley. Three out of every five houses had rockets, rocket launchers in them and talked to some of the people in the kibbutz. Uh, they raised chickens there, you know, and they had to defend the line before their soldiers could because the soldiers had to wait for orders, but these ordinary citizens, you know, just uh, had to defend. And they were telling us about different attacks that they held the line for. And there's UN towers there, but they're... <laughs> They don't pay any attention to what's going on, really. A Muslim was asked why he kept fighting against Israel when they were continually being defeated all the time. And he said, you don't understand. We only have to win once. And so they continually try and come against Israel again and again. There had been trouble on the West Bank. Israel's been uh, uh, preemptive strikes into uh, Iran. This is all a part of the last days. We're living in the last days of the last days. This is, you know, things when you watch the news at night, this is what's recorded in scripture. These things are going to happen. Uh, now the expression is from the river to the sea, which means to wipe out every single Jew from the Euphrates River to the Mediterranean Sea. Again, in Zechariah 12, 8, Zechariah said, 
and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. Now David was a mighty warrior, didn't fear going into battle. When I was in Israel, we shared a Shabbat dinner with a Jewish family, and he was asked, with all these missile attacks and air raids, does that bother you? He smiled, and he reached back and pulled a book off his shelf, and he says, this is a book of the history of our persecution and attacks against us. He says, this is who we are. He says, no, we're not afraid. This is the life that we live. You know, just, uh, and I was surprised when I first came into Jerusalem. I saw a girl about 18 years old walking across the street with a loaded AK-47. And, you know, just, and then that Friday on the Shabbat, I uh, was at the Wailing Wall. There was a group of about 30 teenagers, like you would see on a typical Friday night, you know, just around here. But every one of them was armed, you know, just in case. Because in Israel, they have to join the service, male or female. You know, when they graduate from high school, they're a part of the military uh, service. I was asked by our guide why we call our service uh, the armed forces when none of them are armed. <laughs> I didn't have an answer, but all of them are armed, you know, so... Uh, now we're going to go into Ezekiel 38, uh, the coming war with Russia. In chapter 38, it's future, but it is much closer, I think, than any of us think. The countries are all lined up and they're ready to go. God is putting hooks into the mouths of these nations and he's drawing them into places, as Ezekiel 38 4 says. But let me read Ezekiel 38, 1 to 3. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Magog has long been recognized as Russia. In Jewish newspapers, they might even have Magog instead of Russia in there. Meshach is its capital, or Moscow. If you would look at a globe and... Uh, you would see Moscow, it is practically on the same longitude line as Jerusalem. It's directly north, and they are referred to as the army to the north in verse 15. Tubal has been recognized as Tobolsk, the second oldest Russian city east of the Ural Mountains, founded in 1590. Verse 5 tells us they will bring in all sorts of armor. When Dr. Schofield wrote his Schofield Study Bible at the beginning of the 20th century, he was criticized for saying Russia would attack Israel. How could they? Russia is a Christian nation. He said, I can only write what God's word says. Uh, since then, the Bolshevik re revolution took place, and then men like Lenin and Stalin have been in power, and uh, they brought in communism, and now Putin uh, is ruling from there. Ezekiel 38, verse 5 and 6. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, and the house of Tagarmer of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. This is identifying the people that are going to come against Israel. Persia is modern day Iran and Iraq, but from Iran, which Hezbollah and Hamas are supported by. Ethiopia is anti Israel. But when the scripture refers to Ethiopia, they're referring to the land directly south of Egypt, which would be the Sudan. But Sudan and Ethiopia, they both come against Israel. Libya is just west of Egypt. They will join these forces. Gomer is modern-day Germany. They have long been anti-Semitic, and they have trade with the likes of Iran on a grand scale. After World War II, it was referred to as East and West Germany, until uh, Gorbachev uh, toward the Berlin Wall down. Uh, it wouldn't have been East and West Germany, for Scripture says that Gomer and all his bands, East and West, would both be coming together. So I, I knew even back then that, that Germany would be united because I was reading Scripture, not the newspapers. Uh, the house of Tagarma of the North Quarters is Turkey, which is directly north of Israel, and it says in all its bands. Now, the Turks had ruled the Ottoman Empire 
for about four to 500 years in through the Middle East. And that would include other countries like Georgia, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and all the other stand Muslim countries. Before it says, and I will bring many people with thee, in verse 15 it says, and they will come from the north parts. But there's something strange here. There's certain countries that are missing that are described in this war. And those are the countries that surround Israel. You know, just uh, uh, what about Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Gaza, you know, just in the West Bank. You know, Psalm 83 answers that question. Psalm 83, 4 reads, they have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. This has long been the cry of these nations, exactly quoting uh, that Israel should no longer exist as a nation. In Psalm 83, verses 5 to 8, it lists these nations. Uh, Edom, Moab, Ammon, Lot, and Hagarines were all part of what is now known as Jordan. Gebel and Tyre were Lebanon. Amalek of Saudi Arabia. The Philistines were in Gaza. Asur, uh, Asher is Syria. And the Ishmaelites are on the West Bank. Now, look for these nations to come against Israel, and they will be soundly defeated. As the rest of this psalm points out, then the Russian invasion will begin. Now, we're seeing this on the news right now. Gaza looks like it's been practically wiped flat, you know, just all the bombing. And Israel's starting to do the same thing in Lebanon. There's preemptive strikes as well. Uh, Isaiah 19.1 describes Damascus as a ruinous heap. It's going to become that uh, uh, in short order as well. So we're seeing the beginnings of these wars. We're seeing Psalm 83 being fulfilled. You know, I thought it would be like they've had in the past everybody coming at once. But right now it looks like one at a time that Israel's taken care of. But, you know, God fights for Israel in many, many ways. Um, look for the nations to come against Israel and they'll be soundly defeated, as the rest of the psalm points out. Um, since October of last year, you know, just we have seen the prophetic clock seemingly ticking faster. Things are closing up and you can start to see, man, this is shaping up, you know, like the Bible says. When will this occur? Ezekiel 38, 8. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many peoples against the mountains of Israel, which have always uh, been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Ezekiel writes that after many days, in the latter years, you will see uh, Israel come back into the land, and these events starting to line up. The, line, the land was bought, uh, brought back from the edge of the sword because of the results of uh, World War II and, and the Jewish Holocaust, six million Jews being uh, slaughtered and murdered. There was a cry out for the Jews' own homeland. Uh, they will be called out of many nations to the mountains of Israel that have been a waste. Israel, since 70 AD to roughly 1850, was a waste. As we talked about last week, there was hardly a tree or blade of grass or anything in Israel, but the land has come alive. Um, this is identified as the last days in verse 16 of this chapter as well. It also says the strike against Israel will be in the latter days. In verse 11, it describes them coming against the land of unwalled villages not having bars or gates. For a city to exist in Ezekiel's time when he wrote this, if that city didn't have uh, gates and bars, it just didn't exist. Even in America, we have cities like Fort Wayne, Indiana, Fort Worth, Texas, you know, just they, they were once forts, but then they became cities. Uh, walls were essential for survival until projectiles like cannons were invented, but still walls gave some security. But after the Wright brothers took to the air, walls became absolute, uh, obsolete and useless in the latter days. 
When Ezekiel made this prophecy, I don't think it would have made any sense to anyone reading it at the time. A country with no walls on their cities? Yeah, right, sure, like that's going to happen. Zechariah 2, verse 4 and 5 said, And he said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. You know, so uh, Zechariah writes about cities without walls and gates as well. Zechariah also speaks about their towns being without walls. And besides the iron dome that protects Israel from many onslaughts of missiles fired, God has supernaturally protected Israel as well. Let me go down a little rabbit hole here for a second. In Isaiah 44, verse 28, that's not in your notes. And Isaiah 45, 1, are verses two together but separated chapter-wise. Uh, it mentions Cyrus in both of those verses that God is going to raise up. He will be a shepherd to my people. Uh, he will be uh, do my pleasure. He will be my anointed. You know, and just, uh, and he was. Cyrus was a Medo-Persian king that sent the Jews back to their homeland after they defeated Babylon. But when Isaiah wrote this, it was 150 years before Cyrus was even born. God named him by name 150 years before he was even named. Now, there's something unique about names. In World War I, General Allenby was to take Jerusalem. He was a, a British general, but he was raised as a Christian in a home, went to Sunday school. His mother was a very devout Christian, and he was to take Jerusalem. And he didn't want to ruin any of the buildings. And he, it just bothered him so much. And he was in prayer in his tent before the attack and just asking God to give him some means of being able to take Jerusalem without destroying any of the buildings. And then the next day, God put a plan in his heart. And he commandeered every plane he could, even captured German planes. This is in World War I. These are the biplanes. And he got them all together. They flew over Jerusalem, nose to tail, and dropped leaflets demanding their surrender, signed by Gen General Allenby. But when they translated it into Arabic, Allenby translated it into Allah Bey, signed by the Son of God. <laughs> The Turks fled Jerusalem, not a fire a shot was fired, and he took the city. Today in Jerusalem, there's the Allen Bay Bridge in his honor. <laughs> so, you know, just uh, God has unique ways of bringing about his will in just phenomenal ways. Uh, why are these nations coming against Israel? Besides the fact that anti-Semiticism is demon-driven, uh, they have come to take a spoil, as it says in verse 13, from the people that now inhabit the former waste places and to take goods. What spoil? Well, the contents of the Dead Sea are valued about $18 trillion. The Dead Sea is the lowest spot on the face of the earth where minerals have been washed into it since the beginning of time. Israel is home to 18 billionaires and 105,000 millionaires. Its land has become fruitful for food once again. Uh, Russia still does not have a warm weather port, but Israel has access to the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea. So there's a lot of wealth and advantage. It's strategically located where you know, the, the world comes together, which we'll talk about in a little bit. In verse 12, uh, it says that they dwell in the midst of the land. Ezekiel 5.5 5 tells us that God set Jerusalem in the midst of nations. It is strategically located. Uh, it is where continents have come together. Asia, Europe, Africa, they come together where Israel is. Israel was allowed to exist, this tiny little nation, because it was a buffer zone. Egypt was to the south. Uh, Greece and Rome to the west. Uh, Babylon... 
Medo-Persian empires to the east, uh, Syria to the north. Nobody wanted to fight through Israel, have their army dwindled to fight a big army. So they kind of left this Israel there. It was kind of like a buffer zone between all these world nations. But it's in the center of landmass. If you were to weigh out the continents of the world and you put into balance them, you'd put the fulcrum in, in Jerusalem and it weighs out the landmass. Uh, if you were to count the populations of the world, yeah, it just, uh, it, again, it's the center is Jerusalem. If you were to look at the economics of the world, uh, communism and capitalism, third world countries, again, you'd find Jerusalem the center of it all. If you were looked, to look at the religions of the world, once again, you come back, Jerusalem is the center of it all. Zechariah 12.3 tells us Israel will have to stand alone. All the people of the earth will be gathered against her eventually, but this is what is happening now. The United States, her greatest ally, has withheld financial aid by the Biden administration and all of Europe has followed. Uh, but they said, if we have to go alone, we'll go alone. They have a right to defend themselves. Obadiah 11 tells us there is no neutrality. Standing on the fence is like being the very ones that attack. So if you do nothing, you're just as guilty as those uh, that attack. Now, let's look at who's standing on the fence here. In Ezekiel 38, 13, it says, Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? These countries take a neutral stand and try to, by diplomacy, to negotiate. Why are you doing this? How come you're coming against Israel? Sheba and Dedan have settled in the lower peninsula of Arabia. They're probably Yemen, Qatar, Oman, or the United Emirates. Uh, let's identify Tarshish and then her merchants. Tarshish, the land of tin, Britannia is Great Britain. The symbol of England is the mother lion. I knew England would break away from the European common market because the passage distinguishes them from her merchants, which is Europe. So Europe, Great Britain, uh, the southern nations at the end of the Arabian Peninsula, they're all going to be neutral. Um, so the young lions or the young English-speaking colonies uh, of Great Britain, South Africa, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. They will all try to play a neutral aspect in this. Ezekiel 38, verse 15 and 16. And thou shalt come from the place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against the people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, the heathen may, that the heathen may know me, that I shall be sanctified in thee, O God, before their eyes. In the last days, a great company and many people shall cover the land, Back in verse 4 mentions that God would put hooks into the jaws of these nations and draw them uh, to this place. Ezekiel 38, verse 19 and 20 says, For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea, the fowls of heaven, the beasts of the field, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth, shall shake up my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every well shall fall to the ground. There's going to be a great shaking. I don't know if it will be earthquakes or what have you, but, you know, just uh, walls, buildings, mountains, steep places, they're all going to fall. Israel is going to go through uh, a tremendous uh, shakeup. Ezekiel 38, 21. Here, this fall is where God is going to fight for Israel in the present like he has fought for them in the past. Ezekiel 38, 21, and I will call for a sword against them throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. If you remember in the days of Jehoshaphat, in 2 Chronicles 20, 22 to 24, 
There were three armies that came against Israel at one time. There was Ammon, Moab, and Seir. They came against Israel at the same time. And they come out of these valleys and they look, there's another army, there's another army. And they start fighting each other. Israel stands up on the mountain singing praises to God. And these people, they fight each other to the very last man. Every single one's wiped out. It takes three days for them to gather the spoil from this. You know, God's going to do that again. All these armies from all over the world are going to come. They're going to start fighting one another. You know, just um, Ezekiel 39, 22. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Joshua 10, 11. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Aska, and they died. There were more that died with the hailstones than uh, they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. This same thing is going to happen again. Uh, Joshua 10, 11, and it came to pass, uh, I'm sorry, I read that. Judges uh, 5, 21, 22. Uh, this is with uh, Deborah while she was uh, the judge of Israel. Uh, the river Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon. Oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Then there were the uh, horse hoofs broken by the means of the prancing, the prancing of their mighty ones. The Midianites had 900 iron chariots, but God neutralized them all by breaking the horse's legs. Chariot's not good if you don't have a horse to pull it. You know, just God sent rain uh, up north and the, fl the floodwaters came down and the flood uh, caused them to break their legs and Israel had victory over the Midianites. Exodus 9.23, and Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire along upon the ground and the Lord rained hell upon the land of Egypt. This is also describing from Ezekiel 39.22 how God will fight for Israel. The next one should be Genesis 19 verse rather than Genesis 9. Uh, I want to thank uh, Diane for catching that for me. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. So again, Genesis 19, uh, 24, not 924. Uh, God is doing what he has done in the past so that the eyes of the nations will be opened that he is God so that Israel will know that he is God. God has no delight in punishing people. That's not his desire. He wants to draw people to himself. And he's going to do things in such ways that people are going to say, only God could do this. You know, and Their eyes are going to start to open, not just Israel's eyes, but the eyes of the whole world. Ezekiel 38, 23, Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. That's the ultimate goal on God's part. He's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. The battle continues into Ezekiel 39. Ezekiel 39, 2. And I will turn thee back and leave thee but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. In this battle, five-sixths of this Russian-led invasion, five-sixths of their army is going to be wiped out. They're going to be destroyed. God's only going to leave one-sixth of them alive. Joel 2.20, But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he has done great things. There is only one place on the map that fits this description. It is far from Israel. It is a land barren and desolate. Its face is toward the eastern sea. His most hinder part is toward the northern sea. God will drive them into Siberia. It's the only place on the map that fits this description north of Israel. God's going to drive this remaining sixth up into this land. 
God will cause them to drop their weapons and give their dead bodies over to ravenous birds and the feasts and the beasts of the field. Ezekiel 39, 6, And I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the owls, that they may know that I am the Lord. Uh, this could be something cataclysmic, like a bombardment of asteroids or shooting stars, or it could be a nuclear exchange. Uh, in Zechariah 14, 12, it says, And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. Their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. This is exactly what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II. While they were yet standing, before they could even fall to the ground, their flesh burned off their bodies, their eyes and tongues were consumed in their sockets and mouth as well. Listen to Peter's description in 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. First the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the heavens are pushed out of the way, and then the nature abhors a vacuum, so that air comes rushing back in, and that forms a mushroom cloud. You know, just uh, secondly, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The first atomic blast took a 500-foot uh, steel tower and melted it completely away. Nothing left. Thirdly, the earth also in the works that are therein shall be burned up. A great fire then consumes everything in its pathway. Peter goes on, 2 Peter 3.11, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in holy conversation and godliness? Peter uses the word dissolved. It literally means becomes unraveled. That is exactly what happens in nuclear fusion. The atoms unravel and the elements, they melt with fervent heat. 2 Peter 3.12, looking for the hastening unto the coming day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, seeing that all these things that are to come, how should we then live? Knowing the things that we know, seeing the things unfold in the newspapers and television broadcasts, how should we be living? We should be telling people. We should be living godly, holy lives, you know, because... This is what waits God's enemies, you know. Uh, so now going back to Ezekiel 39, 6. I will send a fire on Magog and them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. The word carelessly can be translated confidently. This is to a people that dwell super confidently. And the word isles can mean another continent. Who dwells confidently on another continent? <laughs> yeah, just uh, this could result in a nuclear exchange between Russia and the United States. You take the two superpowers out of the way, what do you have left, you know, to uh, take care of all the remaining business? Ezekiel 39, 9, and 10 says, And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth, and shall set on fire and burn weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, the hand staffs and spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. So uh, that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down uh, any out of the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoiled them and rob those that robbed them, saith the Lord God. The Russians have used a Dutch invention called Ligna Stone for armored vehicles. It's stronger than steel, but when caught on fire, burns better than coal. But I want to point out to the fact that they will burn their weapons for seven years. Seven years is a unique aspect here. And um, uh, this could be an indication that this event happens just before the tribulation period, the seven year period starts, or during the rapture, perhaps very close. I believe there are two markers that are indicators uh, to when the tribulation starts. Number one, a peace treaty by the Antichrist with Israel. It is a week of years, or seven years, 
but the treaty is broken in the middle of that week. And the days are very specific in 1260 days or 42 months or three and a half years when he breaks it. Revelation 11, 2 and 3. And the rapture of the church, for John speaks of things that are after in Revelation 4, 1. After what? After the church age. So, you know, just uh, there's a couple of events that can occur that are markers for the start of the tribulation period. This war with Russia could be uh, very well at the time or just prior to the rapture. Uh, I don't know if we'll see it or not. I'd rather be on my way up. You know, just I do my rapture practice every morning. You know, just uh, uh, like I said before, God has no pleasure in punishing or bringing pain to mankind. Over and over again, he states in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that he wants people to know that he is the Lord. Ezekiel 39, 21 and 22, and I will set my glory among the heathen and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed in my hand that I have laid upon them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God in that day forward. And this ties in with Paul, what Paul says in Romans 11, that all of Israel will come to know God. They are going to you know, just uh, be in agony at first, you know, that we've crucified our Messiah, you know. But their eyes are going to be open. They're going to come to the Lord as a nation, just uh, not just individuals. This is going to be the greatest revival uh, this world has seen. And just as God brings all the Jews in, so many heathens shall know that he is God and he has set forth his judgment. And so shall the house of Israel know that the Lord, he is God the veil will finally be lifted off of their eyes and they as a nation shall serve the Lord God. And then we get into something else. Next week, I want to talk to you about the rapture. Got some interesting scriptures and thoughts on that. But are there any questions or anything that you want to ask about prophecy? <laughs> Open for anything here. We've got a few minutes. Anything troubling you or bothering you about? Okay, Aaron? Well, hang on. We're paying Lori big bucks for this. <laughs> and the Battle of Armageddon, it says a million man army will come. But does that have anything to do with China? How do they fit in in this? Uh, the 200 million man army uh, is in the middle of the tribulation period uh, on the latter half. It's the kings of the east is what scripture says. China can put more than that in, in the uniform right now. So it would probably include China, but not exclusively China because it refers to kings of the east. So uh, Japan, you know, just Korea, uh, you know, uh, all those kings in the Far East, they were come and the angel will dry up the river Euphrates to make a way for them to come. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to be long gone when that happens. We'll take a look down. <laughs> Anyone else? Wait, wait, wait. By what you were teaching tonight, then, we can actually, you, nobody knows when the rapture is going to happen, but we can almost see where it is getting very close as if all the countries are going to come against Israel. I'm going to borrow from next week. Okay. Matthew talks <laughs> about he... We know when the rapture is going to happen. Matthew talks about it in an hour that you think not. So when you think you know, yeah, that's you know not that. when he's coming. No, but, I, but I know we know. Well, we we already know it's close. Yeah. Just by watching what's going on. There are no signs to the rapture. All the signs are to the second coming, which is seven years later. And we're looking at the signs of the second coming, and we're seeing all these things being fulfilled. Mm -hmm. 
the rapture is imminent. It can happen at any time. Look, so we don't have to. We're, so we're not like watching for these things to happen against Jerusalem because that will be, that could be, that's after the rapture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Christ can return tonight. You know, just uh, so we have to always be ready. The parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 25. Matthew 24, he's talking about all of the signs of the end times of, you know, his coming. Uh, And then he goes right in. There's no break into Matthew 25. There were ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. Mm -hmm. The foolish ones didn't have their lamps trimmed. They didn't have oil. Why? They were date setters. They thought they knew when when the bridegroom would come and they weren't ready. And we have to be careful to not fall into that trap that we think, I still got some time, you know, before I get my life uh, ordered around. And just, you're gonna miss it. Why take that chance? (laughs) Yeah, why? They knocked at the door and he said, depart from me, I never knew you. You know, and just, uh, uh, so be ready at all times. Be ready at all times. This is what he says at the end of Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Talks about being ready. Don't get drunk. Don't get... Yeah. Unsaved relatives will often ask me, does this... What's going on? Does that mean, you know, the rapture's going to happen soon? And I'm like, well, just get ready. No, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. I mean... I could have a heart attack. My rapture could happen right now. You know, just, you know, there's no guarantee that I got my next breath or my next heartbeat. You know, you have to be ready at all times. Over and over, this is emphasized throughout Scripture. So we're going to separate the rapture and the second coming. And just some people get those things confused. And uh, we're going to go over some Scriptures and lay them out. So, okay. Anyone else? Question of end times? Prophecy? Okay. Thank you, Lord. Oh, let's look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And Lord, that you have not hid this thing from your saints. Lord, you have showed us things to come. Uh, As your word declares that the Holy Spirit will show us these things. Lord, uh, that... We're ready, and our bags are packed. We're ready to go home. And, Lord God, we're trying to live out our days as victorious as we can. And, Lord, we ask that you would open doors for us that we might share the good news of the gospel with others. Lord, may you be glorified in and through our lives. We have friends. We have family, people that are not ready, people that are on the fence, people that once knew you that have slidden back. Pray that we have opportunity and time before it's too late to see them come to you. Ask that we might be ready and vigilant, sober in these last days because the days are shorter and shorter and shorter than they have ever been before. The coming of the Lord is nearer now than when we first believed. So help us to stay ready and keep our eyes upon that eastern sky for soon Christ is going to come with the sound of the trumpet and we're going to be risen up to join him in the air. Lord God, keep us all in the uh, hollow of your hand for that day. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a victorious week.